So if you can join me in welcoming Sherry and Willie to Hedberg Public Library. Well, I'm told this is a program about a night of romance with Sherry Durwilly, and I wonder what she's going to talk about. Oh, that's right, that's me. <laughs> to begin with, what is a romance? Romance is one of the top-selling genres in the United States. It's a feel-good book. They all begin with Once Upon a Time, and they end with They Lived Happily Ever After, and it's the junk in the middle that gives me problems. If you t when I first started writing, I wasn't going to write romance. I was going to be the next James Michener. I was going to write family epics. Well, that didn't go over so well. And then someone said, by the way, did you know you're writing romance? No. Well, I was. And so I found a romance group, and I joined them. And uh, then I found out what New York thinks that you should do to write a romance. They tell you your hero and heroine must meet on page two, kiss by page 30, make love by page 60, and do so three more times before the end of the book. Well, I happen to like to write about older heroines, and they aren't that horny. <laughs> they don't make love three times before the end of the book. As a matter of fact, I have one fan who said to me, I need to know how many love scenes there are in each one of your books. So we went down the list, and I told her, and she said, I read her tenant. There's no love scene in there. I said, what did you think they were doing in the basement when the lights went out playing tiddlywinks? <laughs> so I started writing romance. And to be truthful, I've been writing for 50 plus years. I started in high school in Mr. Brockman's sophomore English class, and he said, anybody that gets an A on the test can sit in the back of the room and write for a year. Well, I was in heaven. Forty years later, I found out I was the only one that liked the assignment. And nobody told me to stop. In 2002, by that time, I could have papered two or three houses with the amount of rejection slips I had. I mean, there were a lot of them. And uh, I was pretty discouraged. I went to a conference, and a lot of my friends were writing for a house called Awestruck Books. And I thought, well, what have I got to lose? So I sent out Outlaw's Son. And within a week, I had a contract. Well, then I had to say, ah, uh, by the way, there's another book. It's called Outlaw's Daughter. And I had another contract. But they weren't going to come out till 2004. And in the meantime, I signed 17 contracts the very first year. I signed with Wings. I signed with Whiskey Creek Press. I signed with uh, Awestruck Books. Well, before the Awestruck book one came out, I already had a whole bunch under my belt by that time. And uh, I kind of had a little problem because there was a little character called Hattie who showed up in both of the books. And she said, I want my story, so I wrote Hattie's Preacher. Now, Hattie was this wonderful old maid, probably about 30, who liked to play the piano, but the only proper place for a maiden lady to play the piano in the 1800s was in church, and she didn't believe. So this dear lady sat up in the, in the balcony and played the piano and read her novels during the sermon. And then the new minister came to town. And it all went to hell in a handbasket from there because he moved the piano down to the main floor, and she just couldn't ignore him because he was so darn good looking. <laughs> So they ended up, she read to him romance or novels, and he taught her the Bible. And lo and behold, they didn't get married, and they lived on that happily ever after bit. But that one was a Christian, and somebody said, well, what's a Christian? What, what makes a Christian romance? I said, you don't say hell, you don't say damn, they don't have sex, and you lose 10,000 words just like that right off the top. From there, I started writing over the Hill Lady romances. I've written, I had a little romance called Port of Fear. And it was a sleeper. It wasn't ever going to go anywhere. It was, it was nasty because everything's too coincidental and nobody's going to believe you. Well, I was very blessed because Whiskey Creek Press published that as one of my first books from them. 
and it's still selling like hotcakes. It was my first try at romantic suspense, and it's a backward murder. You know who the murderer is at the very beginning. You just don't know where he is. I sold the book to a guy going on vacation. He came in after his vacation, and he said, I didn't have a chance to finish reading it, but doesn't this guy ever quit? I said, no. Uh, that's the fun of it. And I always know where it's going to end, and I always know how it's going to start, but there are times that the characters just, they just take over, and they do their own thing. Um, this year alone, I have 10 books coming out in reprints, which I'm very blessed with that. I have a company that is reprinting all four books that I pulled from somebody that wasn't making any money for me. Plus, I have a new one, two new ones coming out, and three new ones, four new ones. <laughs> I lose track. And then the whole double, uh, double M series is being re-released with a new book at the beginning. So I am blessed. I have some of the best cover artists in the world. Um, I look at my covers and I think, how did I get so lucky as to have these great covers that just show up in my inbox? I have one I can't stand, and I've run out of the book, so I don't even have it with me. It was called Boss Lady, and the woman said to me, give me ideas on your cover. I said, I'd like a woman sitting on the top of a hill on a horse looking down on a ranch. I thought that was easy. She said, I can't do that. It's too, too much. I said, OK, how about if she's on a train and she's looking at a pencil sketch? So she sent me the most butt ugly woman I had ever seen with long red fingernails and a colored photograph. I said, this is the 1880s. I don't think they had colored photographs. And they certainly didn't paint their nails. And she's not a whore. She's working the ranch. So finally, she wrote me and she said, well, I, I don't know anything about that time period. I just wanted to do one of your covers. So I ended up with this hand coming out of nowhere. I call it the hand from hell, holding a pencil sketch. That was not one of my favorites. But uh, I have had some good ones. And I've, then I had somebody say to me, we'd like to have you write erotica. Well, what I didn't know about erotica, I could fill an encyclopedia. So I wrote the first paragraph of one book, and the first paragraph of another book. And the next day, I had a contract. So I haven't figured out how that happened. So then they said, who are you going to be? Well, I had fought over names for months. To begin with, I was going to write a Sherry Lee, L-E-I-G-H. They said, oh, you can't do that. Everybody is Lee. OK, I'll be Nora Howard. My mother was Norma Howard. I'll be Nora Howard. Well, you can't do that, because they'll think you're Nora Roberts. I know Nora. It wouldn't be too bad. but. Her next to me, we, we wouldn't make a pair. She's about yay high. But I'm better than she is anyway, so that's OK. So then they said, well, who, now who are you going to be? I said, well, my grandmother was Gertrude Kellogg. I'll be Trudy Kellogg. Oh, you can't do that. They'll think you're breakfast cereal. So I decided to be Sherry Willie. And then my mother passed away the year before I signed my first contract. And I decided to take my real name and be Sherry Durwillie. So now I have this little dilemma, because I write Christian under that name. Certainly can't write naughty books under that name. So my editor said to me, well, why don't you become Sherry Dare, S-H-A-R-I-D-A-R-E? And so I have been Sherry Dare. The last book of hers that I put out, I. They said, who do you want to dedicate it to? And I said, I dedicated it to me for letting her out of the closet long enough to write the book. This woman makes more money than I do. So I just lock her away and, and say, you know, go do your thing, and I'll cash your checks. So far, she hasn't caught on. And we hope she doesn't, because I'm not paying her back. Um, I've written family epics. 
I've written romance, and I've written murder mysteries. And I always said, I can't write murder mysteries. I don't do red herrings. But back in the day when I was hungry, I did murder mystery dinner theaters. So I had all these wonderful titles, Man in the Lake, Reunion for a Murder, Murder by Mistake, Murder in the Meadow. Those were all great titles. All, they all became books with absolutely nothing that looks anything like what, what we did in these plays. But my newest book is now Murder in Red Rock Canyon. And I'm very, again, I'm very blessed. Last year about this time, I had a very, very dear friend say to me, my son wants to give you an all expense paid trip to Las Vegas to research murder in Red Rock Canyon. So they flew me out, they paid for the hotel, they paid for all my meals, and my bestie, bestie friend from forever and I traipsed all over the place. We even did the zip line. I can't believe I did that four months after I had my knee replaced. But uh, we did that. We went to a show. They got me drunk and got me to the top of the stratosphere. <laughs> That's the only way they were going to get me to the top of the stratosphere. <laughs> Promise me booze, I'll go. <laughs> and I don't drink. <laughs> they take me up on double bubble martini night. So we're double bubbling the martinis. One in each hand. And then he said, oh, well, we're going up to the top level now. I thought I was high enough as it was. And I looked out, and it was, there was nothing. <laughs> no walls, no nothing, just nothing. <laughs> and watched these idiots riding these rides. We'd been watching the guys jumping off the top. And I said, no, I don't think I'll do that. But we just had a wonderful, wonderful time. And I. When I did the dedication of the book, I dedicated it to my friend Ellen for giving me five days and traipsing all over creation with me, to her husband Delmer for giving up his casino time to go with us, and her son Tyson for giving me his Las Vegas experience. So writing and moving around the country has its, has its benefits. I have a book called The Tour. In that, there's this crazy lady who's a travel agent. I was a travel agent. And her boss says, we want you to take 20 senior citizens to Scandinavia. And we've got a guy coming along with you. Well, he was the playboy of the year. She didn't really want anything to do with him. He said, I really don't want anything to do with her. She's old and fat and totally obsessed with her husband. Well, let's face it, her husband died, she lost weight, and she dyed her hair. She comes into her hotel room, and guess who's coming out of the bathroom wrapped in a towel? And it goes downhill from there. For two weeks, they're stuck together in the same room. And I had so much fun, because I had taken that tour. I knew exactly what they were doing on every single day. And it was, it was a great, great book to write. And I've, I've had people say, well, I don't have to go to Scandinavia now. I've been there. <laughs> In the little old ladies' books, I have eight of them. Four of them are set in Janesville. Three of them are set in Milton. And one is set out in the country. All my little old ladies are friends, and they all went to high school together, with the exception of the preacher who comes to town. And I have one book that is a... Uh, a true story. My girlfriend had been widowed for years and years and years. She called me up one day and she says, I met a guy. I said, oh, Sam, that's wonderful. She says, no, it's not. He's 15 years younger than I am. I said, the sex will be good. <laughs> Christmas time, I get a Christmas card and they'd moved in together. Easter, he asked her to marry him. And I went to my very first biker wedding in June. That was the same year I went to my first gay wedding. It was very interesting. Needless to say, a lot of these things end up in my books, so I tell people, be careful what you do or say, you're going to end up in one of my books. My husband is afraid of me because I write murder mysteries, and I know all these different ways to kill people. 
And uh, my friends look at me and say, I don't want to be in your book, but we, that doesn't stop me. Uh, I, I went to a wedding of a cousin who was a heavy set gal. And she had been the bridesmaid, or had been at all the weddings, but I'd never seen her in any of the weddings, and so I wrote Never a Bridesmaid. And I had a lot of fun with that. Um, mistaken identity, I made my husband take me to Door County so I could figure out what it was like at, at a bed and breakfast. That was interesting. Um, I had already written that book, and I only had to change a couple of things, and that was on <clears throat> about the uh, fish boils. So I, I was enamored with Door County. I used Door County in Coffee, Tea, or Love, where they went up and stayed in a bed and breakfast. Uh, I have a paranormal series, which my minister said, you can't write that series because it's reincarnation. And I said, watch me. I wrote the first book, which was Roundtree, and it was an archaeologist and an anthropology professor digging into an ancient society. And in the middle of the book, I realized I had to write a book before that so that people knew what was going on, so I wrote Sile. And then I had to write Umba to tie up all the loose ends. So since I, I'm not supposed to reincarnate anybody, I reincarnated the minister. <laughs> I just have too much fun with my books. And with the murder mysteries now, I have, I, again, I know I use the word a lot, I'm blessed. Our kids at church quite often will call me up and they'll say, Mrs. Sherry, would you write us another murder mystery? And the kids have a lock in. They get their parts about two weeks in advance. They get their costumes, the whole nine yards. I, they tell me they've come dressed with pregnancy bellies and uh, girls come and dressed as football players. They now have four, so they can rotate and never do the same one twice because it's just a senior high group. This year they said, because last year we did whatever happened to Thomas Turkey. And their stipulation this year was, we want a real person murdered. We don't want a turkey missing. <laughs> so. I donate those to church groups. If you have anybody in your church that has a youth group that would like to do something like this, I give those away to the kids. I have written a couple of children's books, but they're just to give away at, at signings. They're nothing spectacular. Um, I have a little series called the Bird Singer series, and I love that series. My favorite place in the whole wide world is Wildlife Prairie Park in Peoria. Nobody's ever heard of it. I hadn't heard of it. We went down for my birthday, and I was so excited. We'd been down there before, and I loved it so much. I said, oh, I want to go for my birthday. Little did we know that we couldn't stay in the park because there was a powwow going on. So we got in on the blessing of the buffalo grounds and the powwow, and for many years we went back and forth, and I was writing this series of this woman who goes to the powwow, and she gets up on a bluff, and there's a crack of lightning, a flash of lightning and a crack of thunder, and when she wakes up, she's down on a sandy beach with this guy coming at her in full regalia, speaking in a language that is ancient, and she's 500 years back in time, with a Tico, the bird singer, and the protagonist, Hawk. And I thought, well, that's good. I'll have one book, a little time travel. Well, then Hawk had a brother called Snapping Turtle, and he decided he wanted his own book. Wildcat wanted his own book. And I said, well, you have to be a hero. And he said, but I don't want to be a hero. And I said, too bad. So that's how he came about. Then my friend back here that's my cashier, her and her daughter and I went down to the uh, park, and then we went on down to Kehokia. I don't know what happened. I got two more books for that series, and I just signed a contract to write a fifth, sixth, whatever it is. Write another book in that series. So I've had a lot of fun with that. Then I had written a little book called Becky's Rebel. And I had a lot of fun with Becky. But somebody read it, and they said, oh, Becky's Rebel. You can't write that book. 
vast number of Throw away that first part and just go with the last part. So I wrote Boss Lady, the one with the hand. <laughs> well, I'm driving down across Memorial Bridge one day, and this guy taps me on the shoulder. He says, you got to write my story. I said, who are you? He said, I'm Joe, and that first line is too good to lose. That was the easiest book I ever wrote. It, it went like wildfire. And it was the same when I was writing the Double M series, which is a family epic that runs from 1867 to 2007. I was driving out on Milton Avenue out by Kmart, and this guy tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, uh, I'm not dead. I said, who are you? He says, I'm Jeff, and I'm not dead. I said, oh, you are so dead. I killed you off three chapters ago. I really didn't like you anyway. I married your wife off to another man. You know, you're, you are dead. He said, you watch soap operas, you don't have a body, I'm not dead, do something with me. He turned out to be a great character, and writing him was a lot of fun. But for a while I was really concerned about what I was going to do with him. So I had signed the contract for this before Whiskey Creek's press was sold. And so it came time for the first book to come out, and my editor said, I know there are three books to this series, but I think there's a fourth. I said, oh, no. No, 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 no. I'm not writing a fourth book. But you have to write a fourth book. I said, I'll write an epilogue. It'll be fine. Then I get my cover from my cover artist, and she's got the fourth book right there. And she said, I, I really think you've got to write this. Uh, no. So then I hear from the publisher who says, we really want you to write this fourth book. I said, I don't want to write this thing. She said, what will it take? I said, OK. I want it to come out two months after the book, the last book in the series. 10 minutes later, I had a contract. And you don't do that to EPUBs. Sorry. Uh, so I had to write it. And I was really on time restraints on that one. So last year, this book's going to be out 10 years pretty soon. Last year, I got an idea for a book called Vision Woman, which is the very beginning book to that series. And it's from the Indian's point of view. And I just signed the contract for that, did my edits, have the galley setting on my computer to do, and that's coming out in June. <laughs> so, you know, I should never open my mouth and say, I have an idea about. <laughs> but I've run the gambit of what I've, what I've done. I've done Transplanted Love, which was my healing book. Her tenant was also a healing book. My mom had died. And she had lived on the other side of our duplex. Now, I thought when people died, that was it. I can't get rid of her. The first year, she was a butterfly. Every time I turned around, I had them following me into the garage. I'd have them light on my shoulder at church. Well, then the next year, she was a cardinal. Oh, she was chatty. Then she was a bunny rabbit. But what was really scary was the year she was a goldfinch. And she'd fly up to the window, and she'd flutter like a hummingbird and go <laughs> Well, the day she tapped on the door that she wanted to get in, I just said, no, I'm not going to get you in here because I'll never get you out, and you'll crap all over my house. Now she's down to just being a scent. I catch a whiff of her perfume. But at the time I wrote her tenant, I really needed a healing book. I needed to get past losing my mom. And so my, my character had lost her mom. And she's part of those little old ladies. Oh, they are just too much fun. Um, <coughs> Minter, Wisconsin, I've had people try to find it on the map. Ain't going to happen, folks. But you can tell just by reading which one is James Bond, which one is Milton. When I wrote Coffee, Tea, or Love, somebody said, I knew right where that coffee shop was. It was Jody's Coffee Shop on the corner of Milton Avenue and Mount Zion. 
when I wrote her tenant, it was the old Hembro Auto Group. And I was working there as a receptionist. So when I finished writing the book, they said, what would it take for us to get you into a PT Cruiser? I know that my gal, your gal has a PT Cruiser. I said, I want a purple one. Well, they found me a purple one. And then I cried a lot and I said, I'd really like a pinstripe. <laughs> but I work here and you don't pay me much and I can't afford it. I had a pinstripe for free. So I had a purple PT Cruiser with a pink pinstripe and we had a lot of fun with that car. But that was what my character drove. So by the time I got to Hello, Do You Know Me, my character was coming home from Florida and she calls the dealership and uh, where is my friend? And she wasn't there anymore. That was my revenge book. They said, where is she? And they said, well, we don't know why she quit. So she calls her at home and she says, what happened? And she said, they fired my butt. So that was my revenge on, on the new owners of Hembro Auto Group because they fired my butt. <laughs> and I guess I'll open it to questions because I could go on and on and talk about these characters. Somebody said to me, you know, it's, it seems like you know these people personally. Yeah, they all hang around my house. <laughs> so I'd rather open to questions, please. Anybody? <laughs> oh, how do I keep everything straight? It ain't easy. <laughs> each, of, each of my characters has their own personality. They have their own time period. And so when I'm working on more than one, I'm usually working on more than one time period also. I might be working on a contemporary and a historical, and a, my favorite ones to work on are people that never existed because you don't have to be consistent. Uh, my biggest problem when I'm editing are people who are not consistent. I've been caught once when I wasn't right. And that was I stuffed a turkey the night before Thanksgiving. <laughs> and I got called on the carpet for that one. But um, usually I, Google is my friend. so. And when I was doing the Indian books, I was going to powwows. And so I'd go down and I'd say, my Indians are doing. Oh, they can't do that. Go home and rewrite it. <laughs> I rewrote an awful lot of that book. <laughs> Please, questions? <laughs> Did you say to what I was going to ask? What do you do with um, research for somebody like that, for, for your Indian? The Indians, like I say, were at the powwows. And I did. But when I wrote, I wrote the Quaid series. And when I wrote that, I did a lot of research on the internet because I needed to research the Cheyenne people. I know more about the Cheyenne than anybody really needs to. Uh, I tell people I'm a font of worthless information because I know stuff that I really shouldn't know. Like, how many times a year does a penguin have sex? Once. Feel sorry for him, but just once. So I have a friend, well, an acquaintance. Her name is Bertrand Small. I don't know if anybody's ever read her books, but they are, oh, they are raunchy. And they all take place way back in history. And I went to see her. I went to meet her. And she was. Uh, telling about this man that came to interview her for a radio program. And she said, I knew he really loved to just tear you apart. So she said, I put on my sexiest nightgown. And she's a big girl. I mean, she makes me look small. <clears throat> and that's, if she weighs a pound, an ounce, she weighs 250, maybe 275 pounds. And she's not fat. She's probably about six foot tall. She laid down on the bed, like this. And he said, Miss Small, how do you write those hot love scenes? And she smiled very sweetly. And she said, very carefully, how would you write them? 
so she kind of embarrassed the poor guy. But uh, it, was, it was wonderful meeting her because she has been, she's been my idol for years. I've been reading her forever. Another one was Cassie Edwards, and I don't think she's even writing anymore, but she always wrote The White Woman and the Indian. And it got to the point, I knew how the story was going to go because they all went the same way. So it was sort of like uh, Danielle Steele. I read her until I found out, well, I, until I read Daddy. Because I always had to read until I found the author in there. Dang, if it wasn't in the first chapter. And I always said that book was, oh, it was a good book. But it was science fiction. I mean, let's face it, how many 45-year-old 40, men do you know who can take a 21-year-old lover, make love to her for 48 hours straight in her apartment in New York, and then come and jump her in the pool house at his place? I'm sorry. That doesn't happen. And I was very disappointed in the movie because Patrick Duffy didn't do that. He also didn't have webbed fingers either, but that's beside the point. Um, <clears throat> my goal is someday to have a book made into a movie. It's probably never going to happen, but that's my goal. At one point, Lifetime was looking at books, and then they said no. And another time, the Screen Actors Guild was looking at the Bird Singer series, but nothing came out of that. So it'll probably never come to fruition, but I, unfortunately, I can't stop. I've tried. I would get a rejection in the mail, and I'd say, I'm done. I'm never writing another word as long as I live. Well, that lasts for about an hour. <clears throat> and the characters, the characters are really not nasty because they won't let you sleep. I have one right now that's been on my shoulder just driving me nuts called Blue Eagle Feather. I kind of came to a standstill last weekend, so we'll see what happens with him. I didn't know what elk, ta elk burgers tasted like. But I did my research and I found out. So now we can have him eat his elk burger and decide if he likes it. But that one was, is a contemporary Indian with flashbacks and uh, visions. So where it's going, I have no idea. Uh, I have another book kind of tickling the back of my mind, which is um, Who Killed Billy Roller? That's one of the plays the kids do. And since I now have my character in Las Vegas, I figured I could do Who Killed Billy Roller out there. And another one of Christmas Crackers. And then I think I've got the murder mysteries done. Please, any more questions? Somebody else take Jen's shoulder. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they come at the strangest times in the strangest places. I have two books dedicated to my high school class. Uh, the first one is, um, I don't know, A Precious Jewel. I dedicated that to my high school class. And then I dedicated um, murder, uh, Reunion for a Murder to the class. And I'm running out of people to dedicate to, you know? <laughs> Anymore, I just kind of leave the dedication blank, and then they write, say, you've got to write something. And, I try. I've dedicated to my fans. I've dedicated to my parents, <laughs> my kids, my husband. Of course, in my, in my bio, it says my husband is a saint for putting up with me. And I tell people, we can't get a divorce because there isn't anybody that would have either one of us. I mean, he knows to leave the house if I say it's flowing. Don't bother me. My grandchildren couldn't get that concept. We lived across the street from them. That was one of the reasons we moved. Oh, no. <laughs> but I, would, I try to get it into people's heads. It takes 15 minutes to get into character and 15 seconds to get out. And so I'd be working away, and Miles would come over, and he'd say, Grandma, can I have some orange juice? So I'd get up, I'd just get back in, and Vaughn would come over, Grandma. And when my daughter came over and said, Mom, 
I said, I'm done. Done for the day. When it's good, it's good. When it's not, it's not. Um, one thing I usually get asked is writer's block. I had writer's block from July of 2012 until December when I finally figured out who, murder, who the murderer was in reunion for a murder. And I finished writing the book in two weeks. I was halfway done. Like I say, when it's good, it's good. When it's not, it sucks. So when you start out like with the, the murder mystery, you had no idea what was going, who was going to be. Oh no. Maybe when I read that, maybe you, maybe you already knew. No. And it just, just keeps tumbling and rolling. Huh? I go around for about six months saying, would somebody please tell me who the murderer is? And they never do. How many times at, at Writers Club did I say, please tell me who the murderer is? Because I haven't figured it out yet. I mean, I had a guy in my very first one found floating in Storrs Lake. It wasn't pretty. <laughs> in the second one, I had an old man killed while spreading manure with his own pitchfork in the middle of a blizzard. And the third one was this kid was taking his grandpa's place as the scarecrow on Halloween, and he got kind of sh shot and dead. And that one really bugged me because I didn't know who it was. And then the last one before Red Rock Canyon was this uh, class reunion. And it was a wonderful class reunion. They were at somebody's farm, and they were having a good time. Until they found the guy that nobody liked. Or, well, they loved to hate him. They either, she made three columns as she was interviewing. The man, I love the man, I hate the man, and I really don't give a damn. Um, they sort of found him floating in a pond. And it was sort of, well, it was, you, you knew he was kind of sort of dead because he had a big gash in his head. Now somebody kind of killed him with a rock. And trying to figure out who it was drove me nuts. But we finally got it figured out. So with Red Rock Canyon, that one really blew me out of the water because that one turned out to be a serial killer. So, but now next month I have another Christian coming out, Outlaw of Secrets. And then Vision Woman comes in June, and I have, oh, I haven't touched on the anthologies. Many years ago, I met a gal from California. And the next year, she wrote me a note and said, I'm thinking of doing an anthology. I hate anthologies. But we wrote Snowflake Secrets, and then we wrote the uh, Directions of Love and the Seasons of Love and uh, Christmas, uh, an Aspen Grove Christmas. And this year, we put out The Art of Love. And we each had a different art, and my art was crochet. So it was Lady Jane's crochet. But I really don't like doing them because they have to be sweet. They can't make love. That's bad. They're only 20,000 words. And I have so many people that come up to me and say, I'm so disappointed because I didn't want any of them to end. Well, they did. <laughs> the, they lived happily ever after, and that was it. So this year I took the book tour and she says, well, I certainly hope you, you're writing one so that I, I, I don't, I'm not waiting. And I said, well, well, she read it and then she was upset because she wanted more. So next year we're doing a lucky sixpence for her shoe. So somebody's doing something old, I'm doing something new, somebody's doing something borrowed and something blue, and all of them take place in our little town called Aspen Grove, Colorado. There's no such place. Don't look for it on a map. We made it up. But we have, we have fun. I, have, I write with three gals out of California. So I'm never with them. I write my book, send it off. They send it back with the corrections. I send it back, and they sign the contracts, and I say, that's good. <laughs> Keep up the good work, girls. <laughs> They haven't told me what the next one's going to be yet, but they will. 
I do have a pre-editor. The gal that's cashiering for me tonight is Vicki. And she gets to read everything first, except the naughties. She won't read those. Uh, but she reads everything I write first. And I got quite a compliment the other day because the guy wrote me from uh, Vision Woman and said, I couldn't find any, hardly any errors. Thank you. Because <laughs> when I send books back to, to uh, authors, they kind of look like somebody had a massacre and blood all over them. Because I edit and read. And then I've, I've come up with this lovely way of doing it, and I highlight things. I highlight words that can be deleted in yellow. I highlight exclamation points and semicolons and teal. Yeah, they're teal. Or green. I'm sorry, they're green. Teal is uh, sentences that start with and, but, or. or. <sighs> and so when they get them back, they have very colorful edits that look like somebody bled all over them. So if there are no more questions. What about Nora Roberts got some films on Lifetime? How did she get them? Do you have to approach somebody or somebody just read your book well, and decide they want to make a movie? She's with the New York House and they make the they make the connection. EPUBs don't do that for you. You have to do everything for yourself. I had somebody tell me that Nora Roberts head hops. She doesn't do anything with point of view. And I just looked at him and I said, you know what, honey? You're no Nora Roberts and neither am I. She can get away with it. She puts out the books and she has somebody that's going to buy them. But like I say, I'm better than she is, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> the nice thing about EPUBs is <clears throat> you can think outside the box. Stuff that would not fly with New York flies with, with these people. I mean, let's face it, New York wants all the heroines to be chased. And I don't mean around the block. And, the, and under 30. Hello. People make love older than 30. I mean, when I wrote Biker Bride, my Biker Bride was 62. She's not slowing down. I used to write with a dear sweet lady by the name of Alice Blue. Alice was the sweetest little old lady you ever saw. Five foot nothing in all directions. She had a husband who was five foot nothing. And they were very active. And she wrote westerns. And Alice was just the most wonderful lady in the whole wide world. And she said to me one day, do you think my books would sell better if I put sex in them? I said, Alice, the closest thing you get to sex is he kisses his horse. At her funeral, I used that. And I miss her every day. She was just a delightful, delightful lady to work with. But it got to the point that she was 20 years older than me, and I was schlepping her books and schlepping my books, and don't work. <laughs> I'm too old for that. So that's why I bring my husband and my son to carry the books. <laughs> I know you did audio work. And audio work. Yes. Um, is that something that you have to do yourself? You have to read it yourself? Or do you, can you get somebody else? And does it cost to get somebody else? To it's $90 for the setup. And that includes buying the ES ISBN number. <clears throat> and if you want somebody else to read your book, it's a dollar a page. So I sat in my office with my little tape recorder, and I read Mistaken Identity over and over and over again and again and again until I was so sick of that book it wasn't even funny. But it was, it was a labor of love, and I, I did put out an audio book. It ended up being uh, seven hours of audio. 
So, ah, Felicia. I know everybody. <laughs> I'm so glad you came. And I'm so glad that Don doesn't have to be the only guy here. <laughs> We've been talking about romance. Do you have any questions? Oh, no, I'm still working on it. <laughs> Felicia is my technical advisor for Blue Eagle Feather. So... Well, please, any more questions? <laughs> Guess not. How do I write those hot love scenes? Very carefully. <laughs> Thank you so very much. I've been really looking forward to tonight. And take a look at what I've done. I've got just a book or two back there. Number 70 comes out the 24th of this month. So... <laughs>